Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Landfreaker Talks. I'm your host, Chris, and for those who are new to our show, the Landfreaker Talks is focused on amplifying diverse voices on AI, technology, and data. We strive to cultivate an inclusive platform where diverse perspectives thrive, and in so doing, we aim to reshape the conversation to reflect a more equitable understanding of AI's impact on our world. Today, we have our guests from Jacaranda Health. We have Jay Patel, Head of Technology at Jacaranda Health, and Stanislaus Mongela, Machine Learning Manager at Jacaranda Health. Jay Patel has been with Jacaranda Health since 2018 as the head of technology. He was the first member of the technology team and has since developed its technology and data infrastructure, its machine learning initiatives, and has also significantly grown the tech team. Stanislaus Mwangela is the machine learning manager. He is involved in training models and supporting deployment of their models. We're very happy to have you both here, and the floor is yours, Jay. Thanks. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about Uliza Lama. Uh, it's basically a large language model that can uh, respond to queries in Swahili. The context of why we developed this and how we plan on using it to help pregnant women and new mothers across Kenya and uh, more broadly across Sub-Saharan Africa. We'll get into how the model was created briefly and then how other organizations might uh, use it for their uh, for their own benefit. So a little bit of context. This is the, the, the kind of the situation or the context in which we operate. And the challenge we're trying to solve is that one third of maternal and newborn deaths in Kenya happened due, due to delays in seeking care. So a mom, take Josephine, for example, she might experience uh, what we call a danger sign, may not realize at the time that the symptom she's experiencing does require urgent care, takes a little bit of time to seek care, and then getting to the hospital. Uh, once she does get to the hospital, there may be a further delay while at the hospital and other complications like the, the lack of blood. So we have a program called Prompts in which this large language model is incorporated, uh, addressing to seek this challenge. Basically, how the program works is that when a mom signs up for the service, <clears throat> immediately or the next day, we will start to send her information, uh, tips on foods to eat and avoid, um, how to identify a danger sign, and what to do in that kind of situation. She can ask us any questions she has, and we have a help desk that answers these questions, but the AI uh, sits in the middle to try and make the, make the whole process a little more, more efficient. And then in certain counties in Kenya, we're able to also give uh, moms access to uh, emergency transport. And, and then she can also an, anon, anonymously feed back to us on, on the kind of quality of care that she re received at the facility. And we can take that, aggregate that, and share that back with the facilities to make sure that uh, they have visibility into the services and what's happening on the ground from the perspective of their clients. So at peak, we get about five and a half thousand questions a day. And the challenge was, you know, you don't want to answer the questions in the order in which they arrive. Um, we need to make sure that we pick out the urgent questions first. So, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the questions we receive are nutrition based. Can I eat eggs during pregnancy? Is it OK to eat avocados? Um, but maybe 5% of the questions are urgent, like I'm bleeding or I have a severe headache uh, for many hours or my legs are swollen. And we needed to, a way to pick that out from all of the questions, make sure that the urgent questions get responded to quickly, immediately, before we get on to the, to the less urgent questions. <clears throat> so as you can see, one of the challenges also, apart from the volumes of questions that we get, is that it's a long tail kind of distribution. Um, we get general questions about pregnancy, but then diet and nutrition is, is up there. Um, the questions about delivery date and fetal movement on one end. Uh, and on the other end, questions about uh, miscarriage or baby loss and depression and, and things like jaundice or diarrhea, which are more urgent, but we don't have 
you know, a huge volume of them coming in. And so at first, what we developed or what we implemented was a classification model. And how that classification model worked for the help desk is that it would read every single incoming question and try to decide what is this mom asking about. And then based on that, we could assign a priority and then also in some cases, send out an automated uh, response. Um, so in this example, you know, a common question is, can I eat avocados when I'm pregnant? In this case, it would be flagged as a nutrition question and then, then kind of um, uh, run through a more specific model to try and figure out within nutrition, what is this mom asking about? In this case, it would be avocados assigned a low priority. And then we'd send out, in some cases, a pre-written automated response. So every avocado question would get the same, same response. Every headache question would get the same kind of response. In the case of potential danger sign like a headache, uh, it would first be identified as a headache. Then we would try and figure out, is this mom asking about a mild, moderate, or severe headache? It, in this case, it's severe, and so it would be flagged as urgent. And the help desk would be alerted so that they could actually call the mom and decide, do I need to, do you need, does she need to go to the hospital? Should we refer her to the hospital? Uh, and then, of course, make sure that she does get the care she needs and, and that her and her baby are safe. Another challenge apart from the data is that we receive language, we receive uh, questions mostly in Swahili, something about it, something like 85% Swahili. Uh, it's a mixture of Swahili and English and even Sheng, um, which is the local slang. Uh, and the maternal health kind of discussions include specialized vocabulary in these languages. So we had been running the classification models, but then of course, large language models came along, ChatGPT really kind of upended uh, everything. And we tried to we tried to, to, to process through ChatGPT some of the questions that we're getting. Uh, and we realized, you know, in, in the language that we receive it, in the kind of informal uh, vernacular maybe, um, the off the shelf large language models were not quite good enough. So here's a, you know, ChatGPT, by the way, is really good with Swahili. But when we start asking it these, the kinds of questions that we get on a daily basis, it falls down a little bit. So here's an example where <clears throat> a question about fetal movement, uh, ChatGPT or a mom asked a question about fetal movement and then the baby, uh, excuse me, the, the model uh, ChatGPT generated a response about a baby playing. So that's one example, but there are many others. And, and this kind of uh, performance led us to try to develop our own language model. One that was a little more contextual, a little more accurate in the context in which we're working. And also one that may help us better control our users' privacy. Uh, better enable us to kind of uh, fine tune the model uh, to perform in the way that we kind of want. And, and, and basically we went up out developing what, what came to be Uliza Lama. Uh, these are the six steps that we took. I'll talk briefly about each step. Uh, Uliza Lama of course means ask Lama. Um, and it's, why we call it Uliza Lama is that we took the base model, which is Lama 2 from Meta. We fine-tuned it to be able to better understand and respond to, to queries in Swahili. Uh, and then, you know, this is kind of a, a summary of the six steps that it takes to go from a base model like Uliza Lama to one that now can perform in a, a more uh, or in a different language. So step one was of course to select the base model. We, we don't have the resources to create our own large language model. Uh, we don't have you know huge teams of engineers and millions of dollars uh, available in compute. So we had to select a base model on top of which we could now uh, fine tune something and build something. Um, we looked at all of the, at the, at the time, the open uh, models that were available 
looked at, considered like, you know, which which models are more likely to be supported and which which organizations which are more likely to release newer, newer and updated versions in the future. Uh, we looked, we actually tested fine tuning um, models like Pythia, Red Pajama and Dolly. Um, and we realized that Llama 2 was the most performant, there was a light, high likelihood that Meta would continue to support it into the future. Uh, at the time, Mistral had not been released. Um, that, of course, has been making a lot of um, noise uh, recently. Um, so we we may try that, but but for right now, we're still based on level two. Step two was to fig figure out what data we're going to use. Uh, with low resource languages like Swahili, that can be a problem. Fortunately, Swahili while it's a low resource language, it's not quite as low resource as some of the other sub-Saharan African languages. So we were fortunate in that sense that we were able to get a general Swahili data set, um, which consisted of 21 million rows uh, of data. Um, and basically this would help us, when we added this to, to the base Llama 2 model, it would help Llama 2 kind of understand the word sequencing in Swahili versus for example, English. The instruction data set mm, I'll speak about is basically after you get the model to understand how, how Swahili sequences words, um, how to get the model to kind of be able to respond to queries. And I'll speak more about that. And then of course, safety. Uh, we needed to make sure we build in safety. Um, so there's a there's two levels of safety. There's a general safety, um, you know, which which covers kind of all a very broad range of uh, queries, um, and then there's a maternal and newborn health safety. And within our context, how do we make sure that we don't answer, you know, the the, the kind of questions that could potentially lead to catastrophic uh, consequences? Uh, step three. Um, with tokenization, basically, the original Llama 2 vocabulary didn't have it, the, the performance, like the vocabulary wasn't good enough to, to perform well in Swahili. It just didn't have enough understanding of the language. So we extended it. We used the Swahili data set that, we, that I spoke about, and we used that to extend uh, the vocabulary of um, Lama 2. So the original Lama 2 vocabulary was 32,000 tokens, and we added roughly another 20,000 tokens from the Swahili data set. We then took the custom, the token tokenizer, the, the custom tokens that we'd, um, we'd come up with. We combined that with the Swahili data set, the general Swahili data set, and we added all of that to the to the Lama 2 model. And what what came out of that, uh, what we're calling Kiswa, Kiswa, Kiswa Lama, is a model which, which can actually quite accurately predict the next token. So the next word, for example, given the series of preceding words. Uh, but that wasn't the end of the story. So we needed to take the model, which now can predict these uh, word sequences pretty well um, and kind of tune it to be able to respond to instructions, train it to how, on how to follow instructions. Um, by the way, all of these data sets that, I, um, that I'm talking about, they were only available in English. So we had to translate them into Swahili before kind of building them into the into the workflow. So I'll show you an example of how to or the instruction data set, what it looks like. It's a complicated looking chart. Um, but here, let's say it, the instructions were like, for example, give an ex example of uh, an instruction which says explain, explain a concept or a difference or a meaning, or give an example or give a description, uh, classify a sentence, for example, or an item or an animal or a word, summarize an article, provide an example. And so the, the Stanford Alpaca dataset, which was available in English, 
kind of had these this whole gamut of instructions that you, you could ask or train a model how to write a story, um, create a poem, rewrite a sentence, generate a list, and so on. So switching back. Um, that was kind of the instruction data set. And then we built in some safety just to make sure that, you know, general safety, uh, a, a general data safety data, data set that was available. It's called Beaver Tales. Um, we kept the English, we translated into Swahili, and then then fed that into, into Kiswalama. If you remember, that was the one that was able to just uh, was predict the next word in the sequence. But now... After this process, it could not only just do that, but also follow specific instructions uh, and then have this layer of safety. And, and that's what we called Uliza Lam. Uh, we've opened this model up. It is available on Hucking Face. You can just Google Uliza Lama and you can find an article that kind of summarizes uh, the work and also the Hucking Face page. Um, when we released this, I thought maybe, you know, if, if we got a dozen downloads of the model, I'd be happy, you know, if, you know, 12, 15 people decided to use it, that would be great. And if 20 people um, use it, I'd be really happy. But I checked the stats today, and as, as of today, we're at 264 downloads, which, which shows, I think, that there is an appetite for this kind of one. And if you are listening to this and you are using it, please reach out, tell us how. We'd like to like to know. Uh, for what what you're using it for and how how it might be helping you. So the last step was evaluation, um, basically making sure that it works, that it is uh, not answering danger dangerous questions. Um, and so these are a couple of examples. There there are many more, um, but here we tried it against. We tried Uliza Lama, the, the, the model we fine-tuned against base Lama 2 or, or the, the base model which we before before any work was done to it. So the first question here on the left in Swahili is what are the best ten, 10 best places to visit in Kenya? Uh, Lama 2 just says, you know, it, it thinks it's a, some sort of dangerous question um, that it cannot provide the information due to all of the reasons, to a bunch of reasons. But Ulisa Lama actually gave us a list of the 10 attractions in, 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 um, in Swahili. The second question we asked the, the base Lama model was, uh, write a story about a rabbit. And these examples, by the way, are on our Hugging Face page. So if you'd like to read you know, the, the, the details of these, uh, the output, you can just go onto that page and have a look. So base Lama said, I, I cannot fulfill your request because uh, it's an offensive term that refers to some derogatory thing. It's just a story about a rabbit. But Ulisa Lama actually told a story, a, kind of a charming story about a, 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 a rabbit who learned about music uh, and dancing from, from someone he met in the forest. <laughs> um, and the third one is, what, what causes headaches? Uh, and then base lamas somehow thought that this was, uh, it could not comply because uh, the question uh, requested using offensive language or slurs. But the uh, Ulisa Lama actually gave the causes, uh, examples of headaches uh, or what could be potential causes of headaches uh, and suggested uh, consulting a health professional. Um, the, the responses are too long to add here, so you know I, I've just summarized kind of what what the output was, but you're free to check it out on uh, on the model page. Challenges, language issues, and and as I mentioned, Swahili is a low resource language, but it's not as low resource as other languages uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So while you know, we were able to get a good a general Swahili data data corpus, uh, but the data to in like data on like fine tuning how to fine tune a Swahili model, how to build safety into um, a, a Swahili model, all of that 
was only available in English, and we actually had to translate it ourselves. Getting the data in a in in a in a kind of a format or a structure and that would that that was ready to 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 be able to apply to the training of the model. Honestly, that was about maybe eighty percent of the work. So getting all the of these English data sets, doing the translations, uh, that was a lot of the majority of the work. At the time, also the second challenge was a high demand for GPUs. So even on all of the the cloud services, you know, when you wanted to train, uh, it would tell you that the resources are not available at this point. Right? Try again later. Try again later. Try again later. And Sam had to just keep on, you know trying over and over and over again until he got some available GPU time uh, and was able to get the training running. Uh, and then no existing benchmarks, of course, uh, are available to evaluate the Swahili LLM. So there are a bunch of benchmarks uh, for the kind of the high resource languages but there aren't any that we can just off the shelf take and then use them to evaluate how well the model is doing. So we, we may have to kind of build our own benchmarks uh, in-house um, as time goes by. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge and the one that Stan Stanislaus uh, overcame is that as far as we know, this had not been done before. No one had trained an open language model specifically for a low resource language. And especially specifically for you know more specific uh, or a, a a more a unique I guess or a more, a more narrow context uh, like the one that we're operating in, and so uh, a lot of the work was just figuring out how how do you do it. Um, we are so that other people don't have to figure it out for themselves. We are releasing a, or just finishing up a paper um, that kind of outlines all of these steps, and we should be releasing that here in the next few weeks. And then other organizations or other individuals who want to 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 kind of do this have kind of a, a template or a guide on how, how to go about it. You know, Lama two and ChatGPT. You you hear hear or you read these stories about how. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars to train in 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 server costs and in in, in in GPU costs. Um, so with this process, we we we're riding on the back of that. So we're able to take these models, uh, take all the work that's already been done, and then fine tune it for a very specific language in a specific context, and that only cost us uh, about a thousand dollars. So in that sense, it's quite cost effective, and, and I'm sure that that that's going to come down much further as time goes by. Um, I want to address the language issue real quick. Mm. Again, Swahili is a low resource, but there are resources available. When we also work in, in, in Ghana, um, one of the languages that we're working with is Twi, and there are the resources for that language are much, much more scarce. And that's just, you know, Twee, but but there are hundreds of languages across the continent which don't have um, the kind of the resources and the data uh, that may make this kind of work possible without now spending a lot of money and a lot of time doing manual translation. Machine translation for Swahili these days is pretty good, um, but for other languages like Twee, uh, we know that it's not available and it's not so good and it has to actually be done manually. So that is a challenge and something I think we all should should be aware of and look out for. How we're using Ulizalama is that we have a database of about 1.3 million questions and then also answers. So questions from moms and answers from the help desk. Uh, where we've actually finished adding this data set to the Ulyza Lama model. Um, and what we're going to do is deploy it into our workflows. Uh, go here and then come back a second. The idea is not that we want the AI talking directly to moms, because 
the, the context of the, the questions we get is sensitive. And because an incorrect answer could potentially lead to, to uh, unwanted outcomes, we want to make sure the human is in the loop at all times. So at no point will the AI ever respond uh, uh, directly to the mom. What we're actually doing is the AI will suggest a response and that response will go to the help desk. The help desk agent will review that response and say, is this, uh, this suggested response, does it make sense? Is it appropriate? Is it safe? Is it actually addressing the mom's response? Is it polite? And then if it is, the help desk will will say, okay, this message is okay to send out as it is. And then the mom will uh, receive the message. Um, if the message is not correct, or then the help desk has the option to edit it, to make sure that it is um, edited for, for content and for accuracy and for politeness before being forwarded on to the mom. And so the help desk then uh, becomes more like a kind of a, almost a moderator and they're able to turn these questions around more, uh, a little faster, right? So then uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll find out for sure if this is how it works over the next few weeks, but hopefully they're not like typing responses, they're not looking at a knowledge base or searching a knowledge base, unless they, they have a very specific, uh, um, a specific kind of query. Um, the, the hope is that the model will generate accurate, polite answers um, for, but 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 again, we all, always want the help desk to be in the loop to be reviewing these. Um, here's a couple of questions that we tested out. So the first one was asked in Swahili, I have stomach pain and diarrhea, which medicine should I take? And the response, I'll just read it, is that it's not it's important not to take or swallow any medication during pregnancy without a doctor's prescription. Please go to the hospital whenever you feel ill so that your doctor can recommend treatment methods that are safe for you and your growing baby. And here's the second one. Um, I'm suffering from dizziness for two days. Which medicines should I take? So again, it's important not to take any medication uh, and go to the hospital. So making sure that we've kind of built in some safety to these things, but also making sure that the help desk is still in the loop and make uh, are, are vetting these responses. We have a small um, partnership with CHAI, uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative about immunization work in Eswatini. There's no AI kind of implemented there yet. Uh, in Ghana, there is. Uh, early in the presentation, I spoke about classification models. So we have those running in, in Ghana. I don't think we have enough data in TWI yet to be able to build um, in like a working large language model in that in that language, but we are ex exploring some options. Again, we have opened up Uli Salama, and our commitment is to make sure that as much as possible, we are able to share it back with the community the resources that we're able to build and also the knowledge and the experience and the lessons that we learned from building building all these models. That's it, uh, thank you um, for your time. This is my email address, this is Stan's email address. Feel free to reach out at any time with any questions, but I'm also, and we're also happy to answer any questions you have now. So let's officially move into the discussion period right now. We will start with a couple of questions to sort of understand Jacaranda Health more. Then we come back into questions relating to Eliza Lama, and then we wrap up with another, some more other personal questions. So the first question we usually ask our guests, if you can describe Jacaranda Health in one phrase, since you both represent Jacaranda Health, so how would you describe Jacaranda Health in in a phrase, what is Jacaranda health? Uh, I think that the one phrase would be, is that we wanna make sure that all women and their families experience childbirth safely and with dignity and all newborns get a safe start in life. Um, that kind of 
covers or encompasses like the entirety of our mission and that everyone in the organization is really focused on making sure uh, that we that we drive towards that goal. I see. That's that's very, very wonderful. And could you sort of walk us through how Jacaranda Health sort of started and started on this mission that you just described? Sort of like a, a brief history. Sure. So I think this was about six years ago where the team at the time wanted to study whether push messages, like one-way push messages, could influence care seeking behavior make, to help moms uh, you know first of all be more informed about their their pregnancy their health and the health of their baby but also um see if that led to increased uh, health seeking behaviors like increased ANC or antenatal care visits uh, at at the health facility moms basically visiting the hospital for uh, and uh, an internal study showed that that did happen, but the way the technology was set up at the time was was two way. We hadn't actually planned on it being two way, uh, but we're, what happened was that moms actually started sending us questions. We we hadn't you know anticipated that, uh, but it showed that there is a demand for this kind of service. That moms are curious. Maybe they you know when they go to a facility. There's a large queue, and the providers, the healthcare providers, uh, may not have the opportunity to give them the one-on-one -on -one kind of care that they 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 desire. And so, moms just started asking us questions, and uh, and so we hired on a help desk to help respond to these questions. We started building out the systems around quality, around making sure that you know we are providing accurate, safe uh, answers. Um, and at that time, we were getting 100 questions a day. I think we had one help desk agent. Uh, it's just grown. Uh, we've we've enrolled over time two and a half million moms into the platform. We now get five and a half questions a day uh, across, I believe, 20, 24 counties in Kenya. Um, and, and the help desk team is like something like 12 or 13 people. Thank you very much. That's that's really, really, really impressive. Just to clarify, when you say push messages, what what are push messages exactly? Well, these are messages which are sent to the mom unprompted, right? So she's not asking a question to which we're responding. We'll just send mm -hmm. a message like on the day after she signs up, we'll just send a message saying, these are the kinds of foods to eat uh, during pregnancy. The, day, the next day, we might say, these are the kinds of foods to avoid during pregnancy. Uh, the following day, um, you know, this is what a headache means when you're pregnant, uh, and so on. I see. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that Jacaranda Health sort of started as sending these push messages and then evolved into this back and forth communication, correct? That's correct, uh, and in fact, we 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 didn't even uh, plan for that. It, it's just that because the, of the way we had set up the technology, it uh, offered moms the options to to ask questions, and and they just naturally started asking questions, which which we then realized that that there was a demand for this kind of service. I see, I see. That's that's really really wonderful, and the communication at that time. In what language was it majorly in? Was it in Swahili or English or a mix? Uh, mix, but mostly Swahili. It's, uh, it's a little bit of English. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay, that's that's really wonderful. Okay, then we move on to the let's go into the technical part a bit. So we you talked about Uliza Lama. You described the six step process where you 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 curated the data you did pre-training then instruction fine-tuning what what were some of the major challenges that you faced in this six-step process um i think we had shared some of them so some of them 
was mostly within the evaluation framework uh, for Swahili. Then um, the others were, okay, specifically one of the challenges was uh, how the base model Lama 2 was also uh, tokenizing our data set, uh, our Swahili data set. It was not tokenizing it quite well. So we had now to create our own um, tokenizer, but extending the Lama 2 tokenizer, that was also a challenge, trying to see how best can we uh, make this model tokenize this uh, uh, Swahili uh, text well. Then the other challenge uh, would also relate to how do you do this in a very resource efficient way and also time efficient way? Because uh, when you decide to do a full pre-training, uh, it's going to take a lot of time and you might also lose some of the knowledge in the original uh, Lama 2. So um, what we decided to do is uh, use uh, some of the existing parameter efficient techniques like LoRa and then uh, match the weights of the base model uh, to tackle that. So the other challenges uh, then were also high demand for GPUs, uh, not within the process, but uh, some external factors which were beyond our control. And, and I'm curious, for the high demand for GPU, how did you navigate that? Uh, right then, uh, um, it was just retrying. So it was retrying. So maybe the best option would have maybe to look for other providers, but you wanted to use uh, GCP resources and uh, AWS resources, which mm -hmm. uh, we have some credits for sometimes. Uh, uh, we were uh, yes, yes, but uh, the only solution was just retrying. I see. But right now, there's no the shortage is not that much. I see. It's it's very impressive that your team were was able to circumvent all these challenges and finally get Lizalam out. And I believe that since you've gone through the first, you know, you've done it once, you can do it again. So you now have the experience and the skills to now make this happen again. That's quite impressive. Given all the resources that went into building Lisa Lammer. And also given the, the current trend where companies are now going more into closed source AI, despite a lot of calls to be more open source. I'm curious, what was the rationale for Jacaranda Health? What was the rationale behind open source and Oliza Lama when you could easily just make it closed source and just make it a kind of a, a proprietary model? So why open source it? Um. We would be using it for one specific thing. If someone else can use it and get benefit from it, uh, you know, there's. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we share uh, the learnings, share the technology, so that other organizations in the sector and out can can also kind of um, uh, utilize it and offer uh, benefits outside of maybe material and newborn health to their clients. Um, we're not. We're a nonprofit. You know. Um, we're, we're, we're built on top, we're building this on top of an open model using open data sets. It just makes sense to also uh, continue that uh, and open open the model and, and you know share it and hopefully it has benefits uh, outside of outside of uh, Jacaranda outside of Metro and Newport Health. I see. I see that's 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 good to hear. Um, so I, I guess, there was not at any time any discussion of um closed sourcing or looking at other other um sources of ways of of sharing it without that's not fully open source and that makes sense as a, a non profit with the kind of mission that you have that you you I think what is more in in the the view is actually trying to get this to have as much utility as possible. That's that's good. Are we going to be expecting other iterations of Uliza Lama? So like Uliza Lama 2, Lama 3, are there plans like that or not? Yeah, there are plans to further iterate okay. this. So uh, we're also trying to uh, see if we can avail it in uh, different parameter sizes. Then um, also using other techniques like uh, Mistral, yeah, so we are still exploring that. I see. 
And and what are the plans for Jacaranda Health? So what are you excited for in the for this year? Since we just started the year, what are some of the things that Jacaranda Health is excited for? One of our goals is to reach and help more moms. So we're trying to enroll one million more moms this year. Uh, we're in 24 counties. Can we, in a sustainable way, also reach the other uh, counties in Kenya? And we're looking at external partnerships, like can we partner with maybe private health insurance companies or can we uh, partner with, um, uh, for example, other nonprofits and maybe in, in, in areas like Garissa to help deliver these the benefits of the program to moms there. And of course, we are looking to expand to, to new countries. So Andrew, thanks for your question. It's well noted. I will We will be reaching out to you as well. Uh, we're hoping at least to hit one more country in sub-Saharan Africa uh, this year. That's that's wonderful. And do you have any particular country in mind? I think the conversations that have been keep coming up, uh, and not, no decisions have been made, but Nigeria, for sure. <laughs> Ethiopia as well. Um, so these are, you know, conversations and, and named countries that keep coming up over and over again. So very likely um, one of those two, hopefully both. I see. And and how do you imagine, so you, you have the vision of extending the, the mission and services of Jacaranda Health to other countries, other communities, you know, these countries have languages, they have their own contextual nuances and different things. So how do you imagine AI, whether it's large language models or something else, how do you imagine it coming into play to help with this vision of Jacaranda Health? Sure. When we go to new countries, we want to make sure that we do focus group discussions with moms on the ground, make sure that they understand the messages we're sending out, um, you know, if we talk about a certain food group, is it actually also available there? And if not, do we need to adjust our uh, messaging accordingly? Uh, and are the messages understandable? You know, are they friendly? Are, are mom's going to respond to them. So that kind of design work is always going on whenever we move to a new region, whether in Kenya or uh, across the continent. Uh, secondly, as much as possible, you know, we're not going to freeze these models, you know, at point of deployment. We do want to make sure that we continuously update them uh, and make sure that local nuances and local kind of uh, language uh, language nuances are also captured and responded to appropriately. Um, in, you know, in low, maybe low literacy regions, what we're experimenting with is voice as well. So, we run everything over SMS primarily because a lot of our users still have the feature phones, uh, not smartphones. Um, and even those users who do have smartphones uh, have considerations uh, or concerns about data, um, data costs, uh, like yeah, mobile data. But, but mm -hmm. we have the option to run these this program over over WhatsApp, for example. Um, and, you know, how can we incorporate channels like voice into the same thing? Can we incorporate ML, speech to text, to text to speech into this so that uh, a, a mom who may not be willing or interested in typing a question can actually interact with the service uh, through voice? So these are things we're also experimenting. But what's next in terms of technology and use cases? Because you mentioned Mistro and other low resource quantized models. What what's next in terms of that? Um, so some of the things we are trying to uh do in terms of use cases is mostly personalization. So uh we want to personalize uh, our messaging, as I earlier mentioned. That's one of the, the key things we are trying to do. So uh using uh, different forms of data we have. Um, can we take advantage of the data we have about uh, her mom and their clinical profile and be able to do um, risk screening and also 
at the same time uh, do some personalized messaging. Um, and Stan is actually working on fine tuning the same kind of Uliza Lama, but using Mistral as the base instead of Lama. Idea being, can we compare performance? Can we compare inference cost? Um, you know, which one is going to be uh, cheaper, faster, easier to, to run? And so we haven't done that yet. That's still in progress. And hopefully we'll have some results over the next three or four weeks. Thank you very much, Jay Patel and Stanislaus Morgella for this talk episode. It has been a very interesting one, learning about Uliza Lama and the work that you are doing. Thank you for being with us and to the audience. Thank you for joining us on this Africa Talks episode and hope to see you in the future episodes.